and for the hemodynamics monitoring. The CLABSI, when, it, when we're going to say it's a CLABSI, means the bloodstream infection is confined because of the central line. Because of the central line, it's a primary. The main cause for this bloodstream infection is the central line. Means the lab test investigation, it's confirmed. This because of the because of the uh, because of the central line. This central line to be considered again as a CLABSI, we need to keep it in place not less than more uh, not less than two days or more than even two days. At the day of the event or even before one day before, also the, uh, the it's confirmed. As per the CDC and HSN uh, recommendation, it's confirmed. The, as I said, the lab test and investigation already has been done, and it's confirmed. This uh, PSI, the main uh, cause is the insertion for these uh, for such uh, this or that catheters. If we will go to the types of these central lines, we have the tunneled, we have the untunneled, and the umbilical catheters as well. Usually, the tunneled. Uh, uh, this uh, the plan is the treatment the plan is long so it's uh, it's for long period of time as a treatment like uh, the renal dialysis patients like the oncology patients as well and sometimes you and uh, it's commonly known it's uh, uh, the non tunnel it's the period of the uh, treatment plan is less maybe a few days or weeks or less so that's why this is the major difference the implanted catheters as well or implanted port the port the cath let's say which usually used for the uh, for the oncology patients which is sub uh, 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 under the surgical procedure will be inserted and they will create like a packet uh, to insert this one i will show some uh, pictures to to keep the uh, the picture more clean for all of you guys. The tunnel, as I said, it's like it will be threaded from the, let's say, subclavian as a subclavian catheters to the superior, let's say, vena cava. Uh, sometimes either it's uh, treble, double lumen, single. It's based on the patient treatment. This usually for the, like, it's like one example for them, it's the dialysis, dialysis catheters. Uh, for the porta cath or port uh, uh, catheters, usually this will be inserted under the scan. This under surgical procedure, there's an incision. You need to perform it under non-touch aseptic technique. It's like a surgical procedure to be inserted. This is the base for the porta cath, and the septum is here. And usually there is a needle uh, called the Huber needle or non-coring needle will be inserted through the septum. Then you will start the uh, your treatment and transfusion for the whatever is that the chemo or uh, another uh, fluids to be uh, through this uh, uh, catheters or through this port uh, portic cath the non tunnel catheters example we have the intrajugular we have subclavian pick even or the femoral as uh, dr faisal mentioned the, fem the femoral site it's a must to be excluded and even it's not part of the bundle of the insertion and the CDC do recommend not to go at all with the central line or the insertion for the catheters in general with the femoral site, unless it's an emergency. Emergency is a different story. Emergency is an emergency. Sometimes uh, we don't have an access to jugular subclavian. You have multiple RTAs or whatever. You have multiple traumas. Even we can't go for the big line, so I have no choice except the femoral. I can go, but still we do recommend once the patient is stable, and you have an access for different insertion sites, you have to change uh, this femoral site because the uh, catheter is very close to the ground area. Uh, usually the area is wet. So the expectation for the number of microbes around the insertion site is too big. So the migration for these microbes to the insertion site is high as well. So that's why we do not uh, prefer to go with the uh, fem femoral site. If you will go for the uh, statistics for the uh, uh, hospital acquired infection and specifically the PSI, if you will see, this is the Euro surveillance for the CDC, you will see the PSI in terms of the percentage wise, it's 10.8, it's less than SSI and less UTI and the other of the hospital acquired infection or associated infection. But when it comes to the mortality, the morbidity and the cost, it's extremely high. And the upcoming slides will show that show 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 us these statistics. Look to these statistics; it's coming from U.S. And as you know, U.S. as it's one of the first world countries, the mortality rate it might reach up to twenty five percent. 
pathogen means every four patients who contract eclapsy, one of them will die, right, Jen? And this is where in US, and usually we are waiting the data standard guidelines, the recommendation, the studies, clinical studies, the innovative solution from US, and still they are suffering from this high percentage from the from the uh, uh, the collapse rate. Even the uh, it's 1.5 higher for the patients for the mortality. The percentage it, it's really high. So the CRBSI, and now some, maybe some of you will ask, what is the difference between the CRBSI and the CLABSI? It's almost the same, but the CRBSI, it's the big umbrella. CRBSI, it's the catheter-related blood cell infection. Means, still we need more lab tests, more investigation to confirm this is because of the catheter. But when we are saying it's CLABSI, it's confirmed, and the lab test already done. But this one, we need more lab tests, more investigation. So the higher the, the, the mortality rate, it's really, it's very, very high. Also, if we are going to the cost, sorry, because it's not uh, the mode of presentation, it's not uh, a full uh, mode. Uh, the, when it comes to the cost, imagine in US, in adult patient, it's might reach, it's starting from 44,000 US dollar per patient. And this cost the US facility or the government almost 1.8 billion US dollar per year. Also the hospitality or the length of stay will increase from 12 to 24 days. That's why the cost is very high. And here in Saudi, as per the MOH, it might reach up to 165,000 uh, Saudi reals, almost $45,000 per patient. It might reach, and this, Cost is coming from where? From the length of stay, from the antibiotic, the lab test, etc. Even the turnover for the precious pits inside the ACU, as well as will be the less. Imagine in some studies showing the cost will be might it might reach up to seventy five thousand US dollar, which is really high. That's why everybody is working very high. That's why the CDC, the, sorry, the MOH driving this big project since 2022. And they are providing with all of the relevant uh, toolkits, the uh, checklist, the uh, com competent uh, program, competency program. They are doing the education. They are using external resources just to keep you fully equipped with the, all of the needed uh, information and the more is important is to implement what we are learning on the ground. If we are just learning and we are we do not implement this, definitely this will not be reflected on the patient safety or the outcomes. Also, if I'm using, if I have all the solutions that it's really important to be used and I need it, but if I'm using that one in the wrong manner, definitely I will still have some gaps and this will be uh, increase the risk for the, uh, the, for the, for the collapse here. So if we will lock, this is, let's say, this is the patient scan. If we will lock to this patient scan and there is the central line, it's already inserted and it's already in place. The major route of entry for these microbes, there are two, two major routes of entry for the microbes. The first one is the insertion site, or we call it extra luminal route. Insertion site or the extra luminal route is the same. As where the study is almost 60%, from the collapse is coming from the insertion site. Why? Because the skin is not intact anymore. Why? Because we have a foreign body already inserted and it's going direct to the bloodstream. Why? Because this foreign body, even if it's a sterile, even if it's the highest quality, still it's considered as a foreign body. Still, I don't have the intact skin. And the main objective, and there is many objectives behind uh, the uh, uh, having the intact skin and one of them is to protect the internal organs but now i have some uh, puncture even if this puncture is a small so these microbes which even we can't see by our naked eye it's very easy for these microbes to migrate from the insert from the area around the insertion site to the insertion site then direct to the, the bloodstream that's why we will highlight the component of the insertion bundle of care and the maintenance as well, which can really, if we will use these bundles, uh, it will uh, reduce the risk for the, for the class. This is the first major of entry, uh, route of entry for these microbes. The second, as well the study, route of entry is the hub. Imagine guys, 30% from these microbes can get in from the hub. 
This hub, if we will not take a high standard of care of the hub, if we will not scrub the hub perfectly, if we will, if we will not change the cap frequently, definitely I will have some microbes which is, can be growth or still exist around the port or the hub or the access point. And usually these microbes will be diffuses during the transfusion or sometimes uh, uh, it will be diluted uh, with these uh, uh, antibiotic and then it will go uh, throughout uh, in, uh, the, uh, the catheters or the lumen then to the bloodstream. 30%, 30% is coming from the hub and I will highlight the best practice uh, with, the, with the hub before any access point. Also still there is some risk from the suture wing because we are fixing the sutures with the suture I am cutting the skin, so still I have some risk for the bacteria to regrow. And since these bacteria is very close to the insertion site, so the migration from the, the from this site to the insertion site is very high because it's really very close. Even the percentage is the less. That's why the CDC and the MOH recommendation to use a CHG impregnated dressing. And we can't count on the brimming solution only. The brimming solution, it's a must. It's one of the key elements, one of the most important elements in the bundle of the insertion or the maintenance as well, but still the, uh, the, the use of the CAG impregnated dressing is the most. Uh, this is, as I said, 60% is coming from the extraluminal or the insertion site, and 30% is coming from the intraluminal route, and there is some 10% unknowns when one of these unknowns is what is the insertion is the insertion site. Once it's uh, inserted, we can see the regrowth for these microbes and also the exhaust or the regrowth again because of the manipulation, because of the, the catheter movement, because of the patient's movement, pathing or whatever. Still, there is some risk uh, for these microbes to be around the, uh, the hub or the access port or the access port. Whatever the type of the vascular access I'm using, still I have risk. The risk will be the less if I don't have any kind of the catheters. Don't mix up whatever the type of the catheters, either CVCs, either it's uh, uh, um, uh, tunneled, non-tunneled, umbilical, or the BIVs, I have risk. Since I'm puncturing the skin, I have the risk. Imagine as per this uh, study is showing that, Still, I do have the percentage even for peripheral line, peripheral IV catheters, I do have risk. Even it's uh, uh, the percentage, it's 0.6% per thousand catheter days versus the arterial or the CVCs. It's almost, yes, it's the less. But be careful, guys. Just imagine how much, how many cannulas we are inserted versus the central line you will discover it's a huge difference. The number of the cannulas inserted, it's much, much more than the CVCs. But even though the, 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 the percentage Y it's the less, but still I have some kind of uh, uh, risk for the, uh, uh, for, the, for the infection and the BSI. Just let me highlight one simple point when it comes to the BIV even. And the more the rest will become coming from the pick or the tunnel or the tunnel or whatever. Just imagine, usually when you need to insert the catheter, it's usually you will palpate the patient skin to find the best, uh, the best vein. Then you will disinfect, let's say, with alcohol. And sometimes we have seen some of the healthcare providers, after the bribbing, they will palpate once again, then they will insert the catheter. If you will do so, means you are increasing the risk for the cross-contamination. Even if you can uh, gloves before it's sterile, this gloves once touched, once touched the patient skin, it's not sterile anymore. So if you will bulbate the patient skin, you should never ever touch it once again. You have to go with the sterile cannula to, uh, to reduce the risk for the, for the cross-contamination, uh, okay? So the risk is still there, even for the peripheral, uh, peripheral lines. This is an example of a gram showing the patient and the split uh, for these uh, catheters, either it's uh, interjugular, subclavian, even the port, uh, whatever is that. Uh, 
uh, even the big line, I have a risk. I have the risk. Whatever the type of the catheters, still I have the risk and I have to follow the highest standard of care. I have to follow the MOH uh, uh, policy recommendations and instructions. The checklist, uh, I have seen a lot of checklists, a lot of uh, paperwork, a lot of uh, toolkits that the MOH is providing you guys. Just be careful. Usually the checklist should be done by the one who should not participate in the insertion. So you will get uh, accurate, the accuracy will be higher and uh, should you should have a dedicated nurse, let's say, or guy who should uh, make sure everything will be done as per the policy and the, and the protocol uh, to avoid any breaches, any mistakes or any, any gaps during the insertion. The bundle, bundle, if we will follow the bundle, imagine we will reduce the risk not less than 65%, which is high percentage. We have two bundle of care, but if we will go, what does it mean, the bundle? The bundle, it's a group of evidence, a lot of studies, a lot of researchers, and some guidelines, they gather them all in one bundle, this is called bundle of care, for the central line insertion and even for the maintenance. So there is a group of evidence. There is uh, some studies, there is strategies or, or, or quality improvement initiatives or programs. All of them, they create this bundle. And this will be, uh, if we will implement it as a bundle, it's really much better than to go item by item or step by step. As this, if it will go individually, I have some risk for a cross-contamination. Let's say, for example, if I'm using uh, the insertion kit and this kit contains a lot of solutions or a lot of items it's better much better than to have to open one by one the cross contamination or the risk will be higher that's why it means it's to have it as a bundle it's better than to use as uh, a separate uh, solutions so our objective is to reduce the progress or the development for this for this class this is the main objective behind using uh, uh, these bundles so what is the component of these bundles? If we will go to the CDC bundle and, and the next side, it's the MOH bundle. The first item when it comes to the central line insertion, please be reminded, the central line insertion is considered as an invasive procedure. Invasive procedure means you have to treat your patient the same, he's going to the OR to, to perform any kind of surgical procedure ortho, neuro, whatever is that. It's the same, the same preparation. And when it comes to the hand hygiene, again, don't mix up. Hand hygiene, when it comes for any invasive procedure, it's a surgical hand hygiene or a surgical hand antiseptic, okay? And I used to lead the quality improvement initiatives inside the OR. It's related to the SSI or sometimes uh, for different projects just to see uh, what is the main reason behind having this high rate of the surgical site infection? And we have seen one of them is the malpractice for the hand hygiene. Hand hygiene, this terminology used by the CDC a long time ago, and there is three types from the hand hygiene. The first one called, it's, uh, uh, it's a symbol or the basic hand hygiene using any uh, detergent, no need to use antimicrobial agent. The second hand hygiene called antiseptic hand hygiene, it's like you are using the alcohol as a hand sanitizer. And the last hand hygiene is a surgical hand antiseptic. Surgical hand antiseptic, but again, it's called hand hygiene. Okay, so it's a surgical hand antiseptic when it comes to any invasive procedure. So the central line is considered as an invasive procedure. That's why there is a lot of component. But let me share with you during the, these, uh, that project, what we have seen, some of the healthcare providers, guys, they are falling in big and fatal mistakes, okay? What is these mistakes? One of these mistakes is the time frame for the surgical hand antiseptic. We have seen some of them, they are honestly, frankly speaking, is, is scrubbing less than one minute. And uh, the recommendation, it's three to five minutes minimum. And if we will ask ourselves why it's a three to five minutes, why it's long time. Yes, it's a long time. This long period of time for the surgical hand antiseptic, it's just to give the power for this antimicrobial agent, whatever is that, chlorhexidine, alcohol, or even a combination uh, between uh, the chlorhexidine and alcohol or the iodine, to give it the right time to become active and to start kill the microbes. 
and there is one misconcept some of the healthcare provider they think if i'm scrubbing or even if i'm bribing the patient i'm sterilizing the scan and this is not true the main objective behind the bribing or behind the scrubbing is just to minimize, to minimize and to kill the max number from, from these microbes and that's it how much i can minimize how much i can kill these from these microbes how much i can minimize the risk this is the main object minimize these microbes you will minimize the rest to get a sterile scan means you have zero kind or zero number from these microbes so we can't get our objective is to minimize and to kill the vast majority from these microbes okay now there's the fatal miss the first mistake some of them they will scrub less than one minute for example if i'm scrubbing with the uh, chloroxidine chloroxidine need not less than 40 to 60 seconds to become active let's say i don't have chloroxidine i have to go for some solution else the most commonly used as for scrubbing is iodine and the iodine only the iodine needs three to five minutes to become active and to start kill the microbes imagine three to five minutes so what's the benefit if i'm scrubbing uh, less than one minute and then i'm washing my hands i'm washing my hands means i'm removing these my antimicrobial agent means still the number of the microbes is still is high so still you can say maybe you can say you are you are not scrub anymore you are just washing your hands which is not enough the best practice to scrub not less than three to five minutes so you will give the power for these microbes to be killed by the antimicrobial agent this is the first mistake the second mistakes we have seen some of the healthcare provider they will go to the insertion site let's say or the room or wherever the patient is still the water is spilling down from the elbow and they will go to the equipment and they're trying to get some try uh, towel or goes to wipe it off their hands during this period if one spot from the base or from the surgeon or the physician touch the sterile zone means nothing is sterile and you have to change everything even everything is considered as a contaminated and this will increase the risk for the collapse post up that's why the best practice once the surgeon or the physician already scrubbed he has to go to the insertion room let's say but he has to stay away from the uh, equipment or the instrument or the tools that I need for the insertion and to keep a distance between himself and these tools not less than 30 to 40 centimeter as per the GCI standard and the one who should pass the towel is the let's say the scrub nurse he should not do that to avoid an intentional mistake okay this is very important that's why I'm giving uh, some pressure on that one because we have seen some a lot of mistakes when it comes to the hand uh, hand hygiene. The second component is the full PPEs. You have to wear the gown. You, first of all, the shoe cover. You need the head cap, face mask. After the scrubbing, you need the sterile gown. You need sterile gloves. And even the patient is totally covered with a sterile drape, except the area of the insertion, okay, or the fenestration. This area, it's exposed just to perform the insertion to to have the access and you are able to insert the central line and before putting the uh, the uh, the drape over the patient you need to scrub the scan the patient scan and the recommendation to use chloroxidine gluconate two percent with 70 percent isopropyl alcohol this combination uh, will give you the efficacy uh, from the onset of action and for long period of time the onset of action actually is coming from alcohol. Alcohol, it's a fast acting, fast it killing and broad spectrum can control within 15 seconds. Alcohol in terms of antimicrobial efficacy, it's very fast. It's really very fast. But the issue with, with alcohol and why we are using another antimicrobial agent, alcohol is well known as a fast acting, fast drying, but alcohol do not have the persistence or the long lasting efficacy. Alcohol within one minute will evaporate. And this will not help me. So that's why the CDC, INS, and even the March recommendation to use chloroxidine. Chloroxidine, alcohol will give me the onset of action within a few seconds, but the chloroxidine will sub 
support alcohol to give me the long lasting even one or two days antimicrobial efficacy. That's why we are using two antimicrobial agents, okay? This is the power. And the most critical point, once you prep your patient, you should never ever dry the skin. You have to leave it until it's totally and completely air dry. This is the best practice. Some of the healthcare providers falling in big mistake. They are preparing the patient. Unfortunately, they are using sterile towel, gauze or something to wipe off the skin. So if I'm adding the chloroxidine and I know the chloroxidine will start kill the microbes within one minute. So what's the benefit? I have no chloroxidine. If I'm preparing the best practice, Prep your patient and leave this uh, this anti these antimicrobial agent until it's totally air dry and usually this will not take more than two to three minutes maximum and that's it okay then you can after this step you can add the uh, the patient uh, towel uh, or drape and then you can proceed with your uh, procedure. Uh, the uh, usually they recommend to use with the yes with the subclavian catheters subclavian or intrajugular based on the patient condition, which is better than, as I said at the beginning, than the uh, femoral side. Using the ultrasound, definitely this will help us. Uh, uh, this will increase the accuracy. This will save the, uh, save the time. This will reduce the, the needle, uh, the risk for the needle passes and scan damage or trauma. So definitely uh, using the ultrasound guy, uh, guidance it will uh, help and uh, it will increase the uh, accuracy and it will reduce as well as uh, the error. Uh, this is, uh, it's an example of the full cat we can see. This is a full cat. We can see the physician, it's already, he's already wearing his trial gloves, gown, everything in place, all the instrument, the needed uh, instrument for the central line insertion, it's already in place. I used already uh, the ultrasound as well. So uh, this will, as I said at the beginning, if we'll have a full cat, definitely as a bundle uh, or the cat, this will reduce the risk for the uh, for this uh, cross contamination. When it comes to the maintenance, the maintenance and it's more belonging to the nurses, the maintenance, it's really, again, very important. And the importance for the maintenance bundle, it's, it's not less than the insertion as well. Even the risk, maybe it's higher for the, for the maintenance because of the simple reason. Because of the maintenance, usually once we inserted the central line, and if you will look, and if you remember the central line insertion, how much it will take? Not more than maybe 20, 30 minutes, plus minus. But what about the, the central line? in place for how long we will keep it a few days weeks months sometimes years it depends on the patient's condition so that's why the maintenance it's very crucial and there is a lot of components that we have to follow, uh, follow to reduce the risk and to reduce the errors and to increase the uh, the compliance and to reduce and uh, to improve the patient's safety the first one is the hand hygiene the hand hygiene it's an abc you can see the hand hygiene in the insertion and the maintenance is the same. Hand hygiene, any uh, infection control strategy, protocol, any bundle of care, you will see the hand hygiene is the first element. You know, our hands, it's a tool to handle, to touch anything. So means uh, these hands, it might be contaminated, carrying a lot of uh, diversified microbes. So we don't want these microbes to pass through even the glass to the patients and uh, we need to reduce the uh, uh, errors and the risk and to improve again the patient's uh, condition so hand hygiene is an abc before you change the dressing you have to wash your hands as per the, uh, the protocol as per the policy as well uh, you need to review the catheter as uh, necessarily so uh, usually they will check it once a day, maybe once a shaft. Once you will go to the patient, you will check if there is any uh, any errors, any anything need to take an action. So you will do it immediately. Also, it's very crucial to select the right dressing, the best dressing. What is the main objective, guys, behind using the dressing before? It's a securement. Securement means you have to isolate the insertion site from the external environment. 
and to avoid any movement or dislodgement for these for the catheters. This is the it's very crucial. Even if this catheter will be moved, this might irritate the insertion site. This may lead for some irritation. It might be it will uh, go to develop for infection. Infection means you have a high risk for these microbes to pass it through uh, the uh, uh, the the uh, the exit of the catheter then to the bloodstream. That's why it's a securement only at the beginning. But now you need to use it as a CHG impregnated dressing in addition to the securement as a physical barrier between the insertion and the external environment. The dressing based on what you are using. Either it's a transparent, and as you know, the transparent dressing, I can keep it in place for maximum up to seven days. So every seven days, you have to change it. Even after seven day, days, if it looks intact, clean, there is no signs of infection, or even there's no discharge, everything is fine. Again, you have to change it. But sometimes, in some cases, you may change it even before seven days. If the, there is some oozing, there is some bleeding, signs of infection, dislodged, damp, tear, you have to change it even before seven days, okay? But, for example, in case you don't have the transparent dressing, any shortage or any medical supply issue or whatever the reason, you don't have the transparent dressing. Definitely, you can't keep the insertion site or the catheters exposed. So you will put your patient in high risk. Now, what's the option? Maybe you will go for the control dressing, the traditional dressing, which is non, not transparent, non-transparent. If it's not a transparent, be careful. The non-transparent dressing, you can't keep it in place more than one or two days maximum. As per the MOH or even as per the CDC recommendation, you have to change it even daily or every other day maximum. This change, it's a must be done even if there is no signs of infection or bleeding or it's intact, clean, you have to change it. The change is just to see the insertion site, if it's okay or not, okay? But changing the dressing every day or every other day, you will put your patient in big risk. During the dressing change, which is not transparent, means you have, you need to, get, to remove the adhesive. During the adhesive removal, there is some risk for some particles from the skin or skin cells, it might be removed. So if you will change it every day, so every day you will change and remove some uh, particles from this skin, means there is high risk to irritate the skin. And sometimes from for some fragile skin or damaged skin, it might create some blisters even up to this level. So that's why to keep the dressing in place for up to seven days, this would reduce the risk, and this again would reduce the risk for the for the clubs. Okay, this is the most important to be aware of if it's transparent or non-transparent dressing. For the IV set, you have to follow the protocol either either three or four days, but sometimes you may need to change it every shift or every twelve hours or even based on the transfusion product. But sometimes if it's propofol, let's say, or some medication, maybe you need to change it after the vial change. Maybe you need to change it every six hours. It depends. So you have to follow the, uh, the policy and the internal policy and even the manufacturer recommendation for that, uh, for that giving or the ID set. It's the same for the bundle of insertion. So what solutions that we do have? What solutions we do have? We have a lot of solution that we can use to increase the compliance and to reduce the error and again to improve the patient outcomes. One of these solutions is the hand hygiene. It's called Avagard. The beauty in this Avagard, it's a brushless, it's waterless, it's a scrubless. No need to use the washer, no need to use the water, no need to use the brushes at all. It's just you will rub your hands with this uh, antimicrobial agent. It's a combination with alcohol and chlorhexidine gluconate 1%. The beauty in this one, it's a fast acting, fast drying, and the compliance with will be very high. During the application, once you apply it over the scan, no need to wash your hands. You will leave it over your scan. And also it's provided with the emollient. Emollient, it's an ocean base. So this will improve the patient, or the, I mean the, the 
the scan integrity or keep the scan hydrated for the healthcare providers, I mean, not for the patients. So this will uh, uh, really increase the compliance and it's the only FDA approved up to, up to this month. Uh, I will keep the question to the end if you do have any question because, you know, um, to avoid any interruption. And so if you do have any question, please, we will can keep it to the end. Now for the hair removal, in case if you have for the male patient, if they had a big beard, usually uh, for the insertion site, you should not have the hair. The hair should be clapped, okay? The presence of the hair, usually the hair is uh, uh, can carry some good amount from the microbes. Also, if I have the hair, this will compromise the adhesion of the dressing. If the, adhes the dressing uh, over the hair means the side of the dressing will not be intact. It's not adhered very well over the skin. Means there is some risk for these microbes to move. I mean, if it's there is, let's say there is some hair, big beard, and you will add this dressing over the hair, this will, ad the adhesive will not be as we need, it will be weak. Also, there is some maybe tiny holes or space in between the skin and the dressing, which give the microbes golden opportunity to move under the dressing then to the insertion site. So that's why we have to clip, clip the hair. If this hair will interfere with the insertion site or with uh, under uh, will be uh, under the dressing borders itself. Education, as Dr. Faisal said, education is the power. We have to uh, be aware totally with the latest standard guidelines, best practices. Uh, the uh, competency program is very important to make sure the all of the team is already updated and uh, they are implementing what they have learned already. Just another recommendation, I highlight them, just I will highlight once again, because it's really very important when it comes to the patient prepping technique. The recommendation, much recommendation to use the 2% with isopropyl uh, alcohol, 2% chlorosidine with 70% isopropyl alcohol. The prepping technique, either it's circular motion or back and forth technique, but be careful. This should be done not less than 30 seconds and again, Keep the prepping solution until it's totally air dry. If you are using the applicator, usually it has uh, wings in both sides. You, you need to pinch them to uh, this pinching will, uh, will uh, make the um, solution to go through the valve or uh, the ampoule inside, you will crash it. So this will allow the solution to get out and fill the sponge, then you can uh, uh, prep your patients. Also, it's important to allow it uh, to dry, as I said, not less than two minutes. Uh, for the patients, uh, for the neonatal, just it's good to highlight it. For the patients less than two months of age or the weight is less than or equal uh, uh, 1,500 gram or less than four weeks, you can use the uh, chloroxidine. Yeah, we do recommend to use the chloroxidine with alcohol and to avoid the, uh, the iodine, you know, the iodine for the premature patients or premature scan. Uh, it might lead for some uh, consequences, one of them chemical burn. Sometimes it might lead for some hypothyroidism. So the chloroxidine, the, sorry, the iodine, it's, uh, it's much better to be avoided with these, with such babies. The CDC recommendation as of the, uh, the March recommendation to use not more than 2%, uh, 0.5%, up to usually 2 where, and the INS Infusion Nursing Society as well is the same, chloroxidine not less than 0.5% with alcohol, even the breathing uh, technique, uh, as I said, I, it's uh, either circular, just follow the recommendation, or back and forth. Usually, the breathing technique Usually it's uh, almost 30 seconds. It, during the prepping, actually we recommend to give some pressure or the friction, some friction. This friction will allow the chloroxidine to go deep in the skin layers. And this will bind with the skin layers because, you know, we have two types from the skin flora. We have the transit flora usually attached loosely over the skin, and we have the colonization or the resident flora. This resident flora, we can find them up to the hair follicle. So if we will give some pressure to this chloroxidine during the breathing, 
This will kill even the resident flora because you will allow this chloroxidine to go deep to fight the resident flora as this will usually will migrate to the skin surface. That's why it's not easy to have a sterile skin and you will never ever even have the sterile skin. But the most critical point, you have to wait until it's totally airtight. Uh, usually, if we will prep the patient scan, now the risk, the risk will bob up once again after one or two days. Because the chloroxidine, which I'm prepping, if it's in the right manner, huh? again, if I'm prepping and leaving this antimicrobial agent to dry, after one or two days, the, the microbes will start to regrow. And that's why they much do recommend to use the CHG impregnated dressing. Because the brebbing solution, yes, will give me one to, the, to two days maximum antimicrobial efficacy. But the dressing which I'm using, which is impregnated with the chloroxidine, will give me the antimicrobial efficacy for up to seven days. That's why we need to use the CHG impregnated dressing and we should never ever count on the brebbing solution alone. Brebbing solution, yes, will give, give me the onset of action and the efficacy for one or two days, maybe. But after two days, if the policy to keep the transparent dressing for seven days, after two days, what will happen? The regrowth will start underneath of the dressing if I'm not using the CHG. But if I'm using the CHG, definitely the CHG will start, will keep fighting and reducing these microbes for up to seven days. This is an example for the central line, uh, for the central line uh, insertion. Uh, you can see the uh, physicians wearing sterile gloves, gowns, shoe cover, even maybe shoe cover, and the, uh, everything in place. The patient is totally covered with the sterile drapes, and the assistance is already there. But uh, the non-touch aseptic technique, it's a must be implemented to avoid any breaches or any mistake during the uh, insertion site as this will uh, increase the risk for the contamination, especially around the insertion site. And uh, ultimately, unfortunately, this will go directly uh, to the uh, to the bloodstream. The second important solution, which already you are using, it's the uh, 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 it's the CHG impregnated dressing. This is what I meant. If I do have this, uh, the dressing, which is a transparent only without the chloroxidine, now there is some risk for these microbes to start uh, regrowth. And there is uh, a RCT show proving that, that these microbes have the power to regrowth underneath of the dressing within two days. That's why the CDC, INS, SHIA, MOH, all recommend to use the CHG uh, impregnated dressing from the beginning as this will give me the access uh, and the power to keep fighting and reducing the skinny flora around the around the insertion site okay now these my antimicrobial uh, 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 CAG dressing as you can see first of all it's transparent so the importance for the transparency so you can see the insertion site so no need for you to change the dressing every one or two days so you have the access, everything is visible to you if there's any signs of infection, if there is any discharge, bleeding, oozing, whatever, you can see and you will take an immediate action. This is the first important element. The second, this gel bat, the importance of this gel bat, it's impregnated already with the chloroxidine gluconate 2%. Chloroxidine gluconate 2%, and this chloroxidine will give me the efficacy for up to seven days. Also this gel bad, the other features of this gel bad, this will enhance the securement and fixation for the catheter to avoid any movement or any dislodgement to avoid some consequences like phlebitis, intravisation, extravisation. So uh, this will reduce the risk again for the, uh, 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 for the uh, uh, for because of the movement I mean. Also, this gel bad can absorb some limit from the fluid or the blood. For example, this gel bad can absorb up to 2 ml from the blood and 8 ml from the saline and no need to change it. Even if there is some spots up to 2 ml, no need to change it. If there is 7 or 8 ml from the saline, no need to change it. Still, the efficacy is there. But 
if it's more than that, you have to change it. So how I can determine this is 2 ml, 5 ml, plus minus? Simply, you will come for any angle of this gel bag where the uh, fluids or the blood is located. Then, if you remember the bitting edema test, just you will give some pressure of your finger, two to three seconds. Then you remove your finger. If the gel bag will go back to the normal shape easily, means still the gel bag is active and no need to change it. But if you will give a pressure for two to three seconds, then you will remove your finger and you will find there is like a cavity or the gel bag is saturated, full of fluid or the blood, means you have to change it. It's not active anymore. And there is some risk if there is a lot of fluid because of the presence of these fluids between the skin and between the adhesive, this may damage the skin and uh, uh, may, it might increase the risk for the skin damage, okay? So this is very important when it comes to the gel. Also, this dressing, it's already provided uh, with polyurethane. This polyurethane will enhance the adhesion of the dressing. It's uh, provided as well with the documentation strip and there is as well as there is a securement strap two securement strap as this will give extra securement adhesion to the catheters and there is a keyhole notch here this is the keyhole notch this is the keyhole notch just to fix the lumen to fix the lumen can fit even up to five lumens so it's really big this is a small size but we have the medium and we have the large sizes this dressing, again, you can't keep it more than seven days, even if there is no signs of infection or it's intact, clean, you have to change it uh, constantly every seven days unless there is some bleeding, signs of infection, allergy, tear, unclean, damp, you have to change it even uh, within one day. So when it comes to the, uh, we are aware of the MOH recommendation, but I'm here to highlight again some recommendation like the INS, uh, sorry, the CDC. The CDC, they recommend to use the chloroxidine pregnant dressing and to be FDA approved. FDA approved and clearly labeled to reduce the CRB side. See, it's not just because be careful. Some of the, uh, whatever you are using, uh, whatever the solution, be careful when it comes to any evaluation for any product, you have to ask for the FDA approval. You have to ask for any evidence to have the same in size, shape, everything is locks the same, but I need an evidence. I can't, how can I evaluate anything without an evidence base? And the FDA is saying very, very clear, the CDC, sorry, saying you have to use it FDA approved and a clear label they mentioned this can reduce the catheter-related bloodstream infection or CAPSI, again, it's the same, catheter-associated bloodstream infection, and it's category 1A. So it means there is strong evidence behind this recommendation. If we will go for the Shia, the Shia, again, the same, use the CAG impregnated dressing. Before, they used to recommend to use the CAG impregnated dressing if the solution of, if the, uh, uh, the collapse rate is high, but now you have to start from the scratch using the CAG impregnated dressing. Again, for the INS, the same to use the CAG impregnated dressing for any access point. The CDC recommendation, again, the same. The Shia Epic, maybe uh, it's not that much impregnated, it's a uh, strong uh, evidence. It's 1B impregnated sponge dressing, you can use it, but the issue with the sponges or with the uh, the other non-transparent dressing that you change, you, you need to change it frequently, which will <clears throat> increase the risk for the skin damage risk. So again, the checklist, it's the same of the what you do have already, but it's summarized by the uh, CDC as well, which is, uh, I think, I believe, as uh, far as I know, it's the same MOH recommendation. They have everything and even they are going beyond that and they have a lot of uh, 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 criteria, high criteria. They have uh, a lot of steps that they are following to uh, improve the uh, patient safety. The same Shia recommendation. Now, when it comes for the dressing change, it's really very important to be high. The application, as you know, uh, without any uh, pressure, without tension, you have to apply it over the skin as is. 
okay? And usually you will go above the insertion site a little bit to make sure it's a 360 uh, covered with the gel pad or with the chloric CD, okay? Now, uh, if you remember at the beginning, I said when we fix the suture wing with the sutures, still there's some risk for the microbes regrowth. Now, in case, in case the gel pad, it's long enough and you can include the suture wing with the gel pad, please do, okay? Because this will fight the regrowth for these microbes around the sutures. But if it's short and you cannot include the, uh, uh, the uh, suture wing or the sutures here, the priority is to cover totally the insertions. This is the priority, okay? Now let's say it's a seven days to change the dressing or it's uh, not clean or damaged or whatever. Now, the removal, be careful. The removal don't go from up to down at all. The proper technique, you have to go from down toward the insertion site. Why? If I'm gonna to remove it from the top, there is a risk for accidental removal, even partially for the catheters, because the adhesive here is very strong. The adhesive, it's really strong. And sometimes you may need to add some adhesive remover, or if it's adhered very well or strong enough, not easy to be removed, you can add some spots from sterile saline or some spots from alcohol. This will dissolve the gel band and it will facilitate the removal for the dress okay so the proper technique don't go at all from top you have to go from down toward the insertion side during the removal one hand for the removal and the second hand once you removed the suture wing you have to fix the suture wing with your finger as well okay to make to avoid any dislodgement or accidental removal so the removal you need to go, don't pull up again. As you can see, this will go back 180 degree. It's low and the slow technique. It during and the removal again, it's very important tip. Do not manipulate too much. Just go low and the slow in one direction to avoid any cross contamination. You should not touch the insertion side to avoid any cross contamination. Even if you are changing with the sterile gloves, the sterile gloves, once touch the old dressing, it's considered non-sterile because the dressing is not sterile. It's used already. It's contaminated your fingers. You should not touch the insertion side rather than go low and the slow technique until you remove the dressing totally. In this way, you will never ever touch the insertion side. This is the best practice. This is the best way how to remove the dressing. Low and the slow and toward the insertions, not vice versa, okay? This is the best practice for the dressing change. Once it's removed, you have to follow now what? You have to follow the maintenance bundle of care. Before, you have to wash your hands. And uh, sometimes you may need, by the way, no need for you to use sterile gloves at the beginning, okay? Because it's not a sterile procedure, unless they much recommendation to use a sterile, but usually all hospitals, they are using non-sterile gloves for the removal, for the old dressing. Then during the uh, uh, prepping, because well, you need uh, to clean the skin and to prep the skin once again, you have to wear sterile gloves and to use because the dressing is already sterile, okay? This is the best practice. This is the dressing removed to the wall, to the insertion side, to wall, to the insertion side. And you can add some, uh, as I said, a few spots from sterile saline or alcohol as this will dissolve the adhesive and it will facilitate <clears throat> it will facilitate uh, the removal our recommendation <clears throat> uh, instructions uh, the guidelines the same of the MOH uh, uh, recommendation as they are following the highest uh, standard of care another important element which is very 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 important it's the taking a high standard of care of the hub or the access port or the access point, okay? Now, if I have the central line, which is already in place, this central line, usually the it will be covered with what? This is the maintenance bundle, which is already highlighted. The, maintenance, the central line, as I said, 30% from the hub when it comes to the high risk of the, of the hub, 
the high risk is really the risk for the epilepsy is really very high. That's why before any episode, before any access, before any use of the hub, we have to scrub the hub. We have to scrub the hub. It's very, very important. Scrubbing the hub means you need to use antimicrobial agent like alcohol or the iodine or the chloroxidine, but the most commonly used is alcohol. Alcohol is a fast acting, fast drying, fast. Uh, it's a broad spectrum, okay? So the efficacy really very fast. So usually you will scrub the hub with alcohol wipes or a gauze soaked with alcohol. You will scrub the hub usually not less than 15 seconds because the efficacy for alcohol will start within 15 seconds. Once you scrub the hub within 15 seconds, be very careful. We have seen some, again, malpractices. Some of the healthcare providers, they are scrubbing less than 15 minutes, uh, seconds, sorry. Some of the healthcare providers, another big and fatal mistake, they are accessing the hub while it's still wet, which should not happen. If the hub is scrubbed, let's say for 15 seconds, you should not use it until it's totally dry. Why? Because the hub still contains some particles from alcohol and you don't want to push alcohol while you are giving, let's say, antibiotic or uh, uh, transfusion, whatever is that. And also you don't want alcohol to be diluted as well with alcohol or with the infusion therapy. That's why the best practice, you need to scrub the hub and to wait uh, within 15 seconds and to wait until it's totally air dry and usually it's not more than 15 seconds. So the total, the total will be for 15 seconds. The total antimicrobial efficacy or scrubbing the hub if you are scrubbing in the classical way and this classical way called active disinfection. That's called active because you are using your hand actively to scrub the hub. Okay, this is the best practice. We have seen some malpractices. Some of the IV therapies, uh, IV set, it's using, uh, it's it's covered, not covered. See, this will make sure this will increase the risk for the contamination. Or some of them will touch the uh, IV pole or these touching the ground maybe. So all of these, it's a malpractices. We have we have to avoid it. So the best practice all the time, we have to keep the access port or the hub always covered with the caps. Also, don't count on the shape or the color or the design of the, of the hub. Even if the hub, it looks very clean, brightening, not contaminated, there is no clots, there is nothing. This doesn't mean it's not contaminated. 33 to 45% from the hub after the wiping and uh, uh, sent to the lab, they notice it's what it's contaminated that's why if even if the hub looks clean everything is fine you have to scrub the hub it's a must it's it's a must to be done before any access to the access point okay as i said 30 percent from the uh, uh 30 percent from the uh uh clapsy rate is coming uh, already is coming from the from the hub so what is the recommendation? We have uh, two recommendations, either active disinfection, IMS, the NICE guideline, the SHIA, EPIC, all of them they do recommend to, to scrub the hub. Uh, for example, INS, alcohol, five seconds, uh, but chloroxidine, 20 seconds, yani almost less than a minute for the iodine. There is no specific standard. For the nice, again, the same, you need to use a chloroxidine or alcohol for the active disinfection. But usually, it's 15 seconds, as were the nice guidelines. The Shia, again, the same. So there is no specific standards. Five seconds, 20 seconds, one minute, plus, minus. This is all for the uh, scrubbing the hub. But usually, the efficacy and our recommendation is not less than 15 seconds. Okay? But when it comes to the uh, passive disinfection, Passive disinfection. The passive disinfection means you are using the caps which is already impregnated with alcohol or with iodine or with the chloroxidine. This is called passive disinfection. So what does it mean, passive disinfection? 
passive disinfection means if you are applying this cap over the hub and now you have an order to give antibiotic, what you will do, you will remove the cap and you are eligible and able to access immediately. No need to go for the active disinfection. The benefit for this one, this type of the, uh, the uh, disinfection, this will save the time. And the most important thing, it will increase the compliance. Because the compliance we have seen, some of the healthcare providers, trust me, they are scrubbing maybe within, within a few seconds. Sometimes they are not wait, waiting until it dries. Some of them, they are not even scrubbing at all. It happened. So the recommendation by the ANS, NICE, SHIA, they recommend to use antiseptic uh, uh, caps containing uh, uh, antimicrobial agent, which really can improve the patient, improve the patient safety and reduce the death. So this, uh, when it, uh, if you are going to the active disinfection, there is no uh, standard in terms of the time, let's say, or what is the antimicrobial agent. Uh, the time is still, again, some of them five seconds, some of them one minute. Uh, also, the results of efficacy, it, it varies because of the, <clears throat> it's a difference between alcohol and between the uh, uh, iodine and the chloroxide in terms of the power and the efficacy once applied over the over the hub. Stop cock. This one, guys, it's really very crucial. It's very uh, it's very risky to have it. Uh, uh, the manipulation or the uh, during dealing with these caps. Imagine the risk coming from if I have one contaminated. Uh, uh, hub, let's say, the risk for this contamination to pass it through the other and the other, uh, it's very it's very high. Why? Because the space, we call it dead space, uh, the distance between each hub is very, uh, it's very small. It's very close to each other. So that's why be careful before accessing, again, uh, such hubs, you need to, uh, to scrub it very well before you uh, before you uh, access uh, such such uh, such hubs, as this will really increase the risk for the uh, contamination on over the, uh, the the rest of the of the hubs. This is uh, the time; it's 15 seconds usually, and uh, unfortunately, I can't uh, run the. Uh, the uh, stopwatch but if you will usually i'm asking some of you guys to uh, to switch on his stopwatch and to see the compliance and uh, most of majority from the healthcare providers they are saying we are not following the standard by scrubbing 15 seconds and waiting another 15 seconds just to try it you will see really it's very it's very it's very risky this is uh, actually one of the solution <clears throat> for the passive disinfection. This is the caps called the curus. This curus, it contains already, if you can see, there is inside the cap, there is a sponge, and this sponge is full of alcohol. So once you apply it over the hub, this will disinfect the hub within one minute for up to seven days, if not used. Again, if not used. But another important tips and the tricks. Our recommendation, once you apply it, this cap, this cap before it's sterile, this cap before it's full of alcohol. But once applied over the patient catheter, it's considered as a contaminated cap. So now if I have an order to give antibiotic, I have to remove the cap. Now I am able to access immediately, no need to scrub the hub because it's already uh, the, 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 actor, the, the, the passive disinfection already in place. And this will disinfect the outer surface of the hub within one minute for up to seven days. What, so what you need to do only just remove the cap, then access immediately. But another important tip, this cap, as I said, now it's considered once removed, it's considered as a contaminated cap and don't recap the same cap once again. Don't use it. Now this cap is considered as contaminated. So remove the contaminated cap and bring it once again over the hub this will increase the risk for the contamination around the hub and the risk for the migration through the lumen then to the bloodstream is high. Be careful, it's a single use only caps. Single use only caps. This caps in vivo uh, uh, and uh, in vitro sorry, studies showing the efficacy 
will be dropped within one minute and the efficacy will be the same for up to seven days. Imagine the microbes, the number of microbes will be dropped rather dramatically within one minute for up to seven days. Again, if not used, we have different types from the cab. We have for the needleless connectors, we have for the female and our lock, we have for the male, we have for the uh, TEGO, even the renal dialysis caps. So different types of the caps that we can suit fit all the types of the of the hops. So the summary of the evidence, this will reduce the uh, eclipse rate because it is the cost uh, as well as this will save the time definitely and the compliance as well will be uh, increased. So how it works, this board, once we apply this cap over the uh, hub, uh, you will uh, scroll, scroll it over the hub and now this is this is alcohol or the sponge which is already impregnated alcohol. This will keep disinfecting for the hub uh, uh, and the efficacy will be in place within one minute for up to for up to seven days. Definitely the advantages, as I said, it will save the time, increasing the compliance and reducing the, the errors. Again, the key elements to reduce the infection is you guys to have uh, well-trained uh, staff. Uh, definitely this will be reflected on the patient safety uh, to have the standards and the protocol in place. And is not enough if we are not uh, following these uh, protocols and the standards. So what's the benefit from these if I'm not implementing that on uh, my patient uh, during dealing with, uh, with our patients and using the technology, the latest technologies, the latest innovative solutions as well uh, will help. So this is uh, all from my end, guys. Now I think it's your time. If you do have any comments, any questions, uh, please go ahead. شكرا دكتور باسم بالعفو بالعفو برضو استاذ هند اذا في اي شيء بالشاتنج بوكس اذا في if there is any question or if they can unmute themselves uh, so uh, it will be uh, okay if they have any live questions اوكي بس قبل لا نسمح للاسئله الله يسعدك اذكرهم في رابط موجود يسجل الحضور بعدها تمام تمام حنرسل رابط تقييم المحاضرة تمام تمام
باسم يعطيك العافيه وشكرا لك آه على المحاضره يمكن عندنا بعض الاستفسارات في الشات مدري اذا شفتها باسم او لا باسم معنا باسم المايك عندك مقفل ترى دكتور فيصل بس عنده مشكلة دكتور باسم شوية وحيرجع يدخل مرة ثانية
اذكركم بس رابط التسجيل وتقييم الورشه موجود في الشات خمس دقائق باذن الله وحننهي الاجتماع شكرا لكم